Many women in the villages throughout the desert region of Pakistan and India spend their days making Rali quilts, a tradition and skill that started hundreds of years ago. Most quilts are made for every day, and people sleep on them. So they, um, they have like a, a, a cot with short legs, about a foot and a half uh, tall, and a rectangular cot with webbing. And so they usually have quilts that they'll put on the, the cot, almost like a mattress, so you don't get the, the rope webbing. Um, and then they pull more quilts over them. And so those everyday quilts are usually um, a little bit more simple. They, uh, they'll use a lot of times geometric and square blocks sewn together in different patterns. And so that's most of the quilts they make. But then they also make uh, special wedding quilts. And these things will maybe take a year or two to make. They, they uh, will do applique shapes, which are like, um, they're, they're, they're like the, what we would make with snow, the paper snowflakes. So you take a piece of fabric, you fold it up into quarters or eighths, and then you snip out of it, and then you open it up, and you have a pattern. And, and they do that often, and uh, especially for these fancier quilts, like a wedding quilt, the dowry quilt. And then with those quilts, they also add a lot of bling. And so they love to have mirrors and sequins and, and fringe on the edge and little pom-poms and little embroidery. I mean, they really bling them out and they're really beautiful. So they have those. And then they also have, um, oftentimes they have special gift quilts. And these quilts, um, for example, for they have uh, holy men that will travel village to village and come and visit families and, and leave blessings with the families. And these are, they have both Hindu and Muslim uh, out of that group. And um, they oftentimes will have a special quilt that this person will sit on or use while they're there. And so that's another special kind of quilt. Trisha Stoddard first discovered these brightly colored hand-stitched quilts when her husband got stationed in Pakistan with the U.S. Embassy in 1996. She wanted something to cover the bare white walls in her government-issued house and loved the bright colors and patterns she saw in the market. I didn't even know there were such things when I got there. So it's kind of a funny story. I, um, when we arrived in, in, in Pakistan, there was a, um, uh, they, they gave us instructions. Uh, when we left the U.S. and they said bring things that represent America because when people come to visit your home that way they'll learn about America and the kind of things we like and that sort of thing so that was great so we collected you know photos and paintings and things and things to put on the wall and decorations that were American and, and uh, we had them sent over and they arrived there in the country but I don't know if it was the customs people or the foreign service or somebody was um, was holding them until they were ready to give them to us, and so we went for like uh, three weeks and and we still didn't have our things and I'm just sitting in the with the the house was uh, uh, owned by the embassy and so it was just you know big white walls and waiting for decorations and. So I was sitting around and I thought, oh, you know, this is really, this is really driving me crazy, all these white walls. <laughs> and so I, um, I, I, I knew that in, in Pakistan there's lots of uh, textile work. And so I said, I'm just going to go and find something big and bold and colorful and I'm going to put it on this wall until we can get some, you know, our own things to hang up. And, and so I went to the, this handicraft shop, and the way they do it there is they, um, if you're going for textiles or traditional things, you know, there's just kind of big stacks and piles and lots of variety. There's embroidery, there's printing, you know, block printing, there's weaving. There's... So I just sat on a chair and I got, was going through all these stacks of things because I didn't really have an idea of what I was looking for other than I just wanted something colorful and big. And, so I um, spent a couple hours, and I got to the bottom of the pile, and here was the quilt. And it was a, the first, the, this first one I saw was, reminded me of the Amish quilts. And, and so that was the first time I ever realized I had a quilt there. So, you know, finding a quilt, it, it seems so very familiar because, I mean, it's just like any of us would say, you know, you see bedding that's sewed together like that in layers, you say, that's a quilt. And so, 
it was um, it was really it felt familiar, but then it was also unique in the in the way the coloring was. And so I bought it, and it was very inexpensive, <laughs> and and so I went home happy. I thought, oh, I've got this big thing. I can hang it on the wall. It's colorful, and then. Um, uh, I kept looking at it all week and, you know, examining it and enjoying it. And the next week we still didn't have our things to hang up. And so I, um, I went to the next handicraft shop and basically the same thing happened. I went through a big pile of things and at the bottom was this quilt. Stoddard liked the quilt so much that she went back to the market again and again. But soon she got beyond the visual appeal of the quilts and became curious about their origin. A former college professor at Brigham Young University, Stoddard began using her research skills to learn the history of quilting in Pakistan and India. After several years of visiting villages and talking to the quilt makers, Stoddard had enough material to write a book called Raleigh Quilts, Traditional Textiles from Pakistan and India. One of my purposes uh, in writing the book was, um, number one, I was really, you know, loved this, the craft that I found, but um, I, I realized it hadn't been documented. And so I, and I could see it changing a little bit, even, you know, even 20 years ago when, uh, when I first, just, you know, found these from, saw them. And, and I, I was afraid that this tradition might just disappear without anybody even realizing it, it had been, you know? And so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to find quilts and find examples of different patterns and photograph them and get them out there so people could appreciate them. And um, so that, that was really one of my purposes is to not let it change and go away before people had a chance to love it. She says she gained a great appreciation for the women she met and worked with in the villages, especially Permabin, who broke from making the traditional patterns. One of the stories that stands out to me is a story of a, uh, it's a Hindu woman and she was a quilter and she, and um, in, in these parts of Pakistan and India where the women make quilts, this is how everyone, uh, the kind of bedding everyone uses on their beds. Um, and so everyone quilts to some extent or if they have someone in their family they will get them to, you know, quilt in exchange for something else, you know. So everyone uses these kind of things. And so this one woman that uh, I visited with, she, you know, she followed tra the tradition. She learned as a child how to quilt. She made uh, quilts out of square blocks and different designs, like, you know, making a diamond or something with her, her square blocks. And then about 19, she's in her early 70s now, but about 1985, she just decided to do her own thing. And so she made these really fabulous quilts. She used bright colors and she made lines and she made all these different designs. And she was saying that her neighbors laughed at her because she broke tradition so boldly. <laughs> and, and so, she, but she had kept quilting for the next, what, 30 plus years. Um, with these, her own bold designs, and just kind of keeping it quiet from the neighbors, you know, kind of quilting inside or when the neighbors were gone or something. And so when she was showing it to, um, it was my uh, a friend and I, it was, um, at first she was kind of, her head was kind of down. She didn't know how we would take it because she already knew her neighbors laughed at her with them. And we thought they were fabulous, you know. It's modern art. It was her creative spirit was just pouring out all over these quilts, and so that was that's one of the stories I remember the best. And it's so endearing to me that this woman, you know, illiterate woman, lived in the village, you know, had this natural creativity that just was amazing. Now Stoddard not only loves the quilts, she loves the women who make them because she better understands what their lives are like and the time and skill it takes to make these intricate patterns. I love the women there. I think those, the women in the village are such an integral part of the village, both economically and socially, that, that they do feel a sense of, um, uh, of uh, importance 
Occasionally, we, when I've been to villages, the women will initially hide their face or something like that, but that's mostly tradition. But then uh, when they speak, most of the time they speak with um, a sense of who they are, you know, where they fit in their community. They seem to know that, they, and they realize that their work is important for their family. So, um, so they're proud of what they do, and they, um, and uh, just, uh, just their, their, their sense of self is very strong, which is, I think, a different perception than uh, a lot of people might have when you think of, you know, poor, economically poorer people. And, um, but, they, but they know their work is important, and the family wouldn't function without them. They're very strong, and they, uh, and oftentimes they're very curious, as, you know, especially, I usually travel with a, another woman when we do our textile uh, research and I remember one village, this is in Pakistan, the, the woman, she was really curious, you know, she just caught kind of looking at us and, and she said, where are you from? <laughs> and we said, well, we're from America. And she said, what's that? <laughs> I mean, she was, you know, she was trying to figure us out, you know, like where we came from, you know, did we drop off the moon or something? But no, it's, uh, <laughs> She, she wasn't afraid to ask. Um, you know, she was trying to place us in her, you know, in her universe. Where did we, <laughs> where did we fit in? And, and so that was kind of an interesting perception and, you know, taught us something about how people see us. After returning to the U.S., Stoddard moved on with her life, pleased with her book and the dozens of quilts she brought home with her. It's like having children, you know, they're, they're all my favorite in some way or another, you know, they all have good qualities. There are some that I really uh, am endeared to and, and for different reasons. I mean, there's one that I loved and, and I hung it in my house for quite a while and it was a very, very simple village quilt. But the fabrics that were um, in it were just, you could tell they had been used over the years. It was really a recycled kind of a thing and then... And I love that just for the, you know, the, the, the story behind it. Even though I didn't know the real story, I could imagine the story, you know, that it was uh, somebody's well-beloved little quilt from a village. And it was a smaller size, so it was probably for a child or a teen or something. And then I have another one that uh, a friend gave me that it was her wedding quilt, and it's fabulous with, you know, it's... Uh, it's, it's extra large, and it's got, you know, every bling on it, you know, the little mirrors, and, you know, very, very fine applique work and embroidery work on it. I think the thing that amazes me the most are little tiny mirrors. I mean, they're just so tiny, and then they, they put these little tiny holding stitches on them to keep them in place so these mirrors aren't popping out all the time. And um, so you, when you get those kind, and you... And they can be so small that you don't even notice that they're in there. But then when you get it by, you turn on a light, or in their case, if they don't have electricity, a campfire, these little mirrors just sparkle, and it's like magic. You just see all these reflections going all over. So that's, what I, that's the one that I, I think stands out to me. But then one day, the Pakistani quilt makers reached back to find her. And then in 2004, I got this uh, email and it said, hello, we live in the desert of Pakistan. Uh, my mother and her relatives make quilts. Can you help us sell them? And so number one, I was blown away because I'd been to some of those villages and they don't even have electricity or running water. I thought, I'm getting an email from somebody, some village that doesn't have electricity. But uh, sure enough, it was true. So. Um, this was a, uh, a Hindu village, um, very poor village, and the, one of the, the, the men of the village had actually gotten a job in Karachi and had access to a computer and was somehow uh, found the little website I had put up about the book. And, um, and so uh, I, I started a connection with that village. Excited to help, Stoddard became the sponsor for the Raleigh Quilts in the United States by helping them participate in and sell their quilts at folk art markets, sending the money back to them via Western Union. Uh, for 
Oh, a number of years, I took them to, uh, there was a, an international folk art market in Santa Fe, New Mexico. That's a fabulous place to sell, you know, folk craft. And, and uh, so from the proceeds that the women got from those quilts being sold, uh, they started a school for their children. And this, this little village was pretty remote, so they didn't have a government teacher or anything like that. They just had to figure it out on their own. And so they got a teacher, they hired a teacher. And um, so uh, we, we did that for 11 years. And so we were able to get a group of children from elementary school all the way to high school and then hire a high school teacher. So it was great, it was great. I can't wait to see what those kids do. <laughs> The Santa Fe Desert School in Pakistan is named after the Santa Fe market where they sold the quilts. The women's skill in quilt making put many children through school. As cell phones and modern technologies entered the villages, the younger generation chose not to learn quilting and they forgot their traditional patterns and quilting stitches used by their ancestors. Luckily, one Indian man found Stoddard's book on the internet. With the help of Stoddard's book, the villagers relearned their quilting heritage. Well, one thing that happened was, and it made me realize a whole different facet of this, was um, uh, one time when I was at that folk art market, there was a man from India who came, and he also was making quilts um, from his village, from in the India side. And I, we were just setting up, and uh, I, I had never met him, I didn't know him, you know, but. He came running over to the booth and he said, is it you, is it you? <laughs> I said, well, I guess if you're looking for me, it is me. And um, he said, I use your book. I use your book in my quilt making. And he said, I, I want to thank you because our village, we, we forgot our patterns, our quilt patterns. And so when I saw your book, I was able to, re you know, I went back and I could see them again and I could remember them. And, and then he was talking about, there was a stitch that I had a close-up of in the book, and he said, we had forgotten how to make that, and we found a very old lady who came and, and showed us and taught us how to do that stitch. And, and so it was just, you know, it was so heartwarming, because here I was helping them remember their own culture. And, and they had, um, you know, moved and all that, and had kind of forgotten as things had gone on. And then the cutest thing was, though, he said, he called my book his Bible, and, and he said, and, and he, this is a Hindu community, and he said, I want you to know you are a goddess in our community. <laughs> I said, nothing's better than that. <laughs> a Hindu goddess, I like it. <laughs> in addition to selling the quilts, Stoddard also promotes them to create interest about the history and the plight of the people who make them. Hundreds of people visited the Fabric of Belonging display at the BYU Museum of Art. To be able to see, so I've had other exhibits up in other places, and sometimes they're able to give, you know, one or two rooms. Because quilts take a lot of space to display, you know, it's not like coins or something where you can get a whole lot in a small space. So quilts really take a lot of space, but for me to be able to see, uh, there were almost 60 quilts you know, up on the wall and able to see them all at once. It was just amazing. It was amazing because if you, could, if you stood in one spot in a room and just rotated around, you could see so much craftsmanship and so many different women's, you know, imaginations and, you know, color sensibilities and, you know, pattern all within just, you know, glancing around. And normally to see quilts, you know, you kind of have to at least in my house, I had to see them one at a time and hold them up. <laughs> and, and, but to be able to see them all together was just wonderful. It was like being wrapped in a, you know, wrapped up in them, you know, it was nice. <laughs> Stoddard also works closely with the International Quilt Study Center at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Stoddard isn't sure where her quilt connection will go from here, but so far her desire to cover a bare white wall has generated a book, a school, the rebirth of traditional quilting, a market for South Asian made quilts in the United States, and of course, her elevation to quilting goddess. Uh, yeah, that's the story. <laughs> <laughs>